Good morning. Welcome to the Florida United Methodist Church. We're so glad you're here today. It is Sunday morning, April the 18th, and we are blessed to have you. Just a few moments, we'll go into the sanctuary. I'm coming to you from my office this morning, and uh, but we'll go right to the sanctuary in just a minute for worship. Uh, but before we do, let me remind you that uh, just about a month from now, May 14th, 15th, and 16th, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we'll have Leigh Maitland and Roger Cunningham right here in Flora. Roger from Santiago, Chile, and Leigh from Norway. And I have a couple of his books here. You might want to get ready, Giant Slayers and Healing the Orphan Spirit. He's written several books and has a lot of video series, and uh, Leigh has preach the gospel in 90 countries. He's won well over a million Muslims to Jesus and uh, in face to face, that's just not in the crowd, but face to face, has planted hundreds and hundreds of churches in Muslim countries. We are so happy to have him come and share with us. We're glad that you're here today and we look forward to seeing you soon face to face but until then, we're glad you joined us here on video. This is the Floor United Methodist Church. I'm Scott Carter, and I'm so glad you are here. Praise band in the sanctuary. Take it away. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I will worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing.
felt fire from above And I've been down to the river And I ain't the same A prodigal return I've been washed by the blood Now I'm no stranger to the prison Now I'm worn shackles and chains I've been freed and forgiven And I'm not going back Never be the same. That's why I sing. Oh, my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday is gone. Oh, my sins are forgiven. There's a kind of thing that just breaks a man Bring him down to his knees God, I've been broken more than a time or two And he picked me up And he showed me what it's like to be a man That's why I sing, oh All right, thank you so much. Friends, we're studying the Gospels. We've been in the Gospels uh, since January, so we're in the fourth month of studying the Gospels, and we are in Mark chapter five and you remember when we last left we had this uncomfortable story of a man with six thousand demons or a legion of demons that were cast into two thousand pigs that's uh, three demons per pig and the pigs lost their vines and jumped into the sea of galilee well we're going to pick up the story as jesus returns to the other side of the lake and it is a story and a story within a story so uh, intercalation, as they call it. So we'll read the principal story that embedded in the story is another story. And we're just going to read the whole thing. It's uh, from verse 21 to verse 43 of Mark chapter 5. I'm reading from the NIV. Many of you probably remember the story from the King James Bible when you were young. You've heard probably both of these stories many, many, many times. And so uh, I'll just, we're just going to, just going to read it this morning and not a lot of preaching and not, not a lot of teaching because the story just explains itself to us so well and it's very important 
and it reveals the heart of Jesus. Jesus reveals the heart of the Father, and uh, we're just so blessed uh, to have a Savior that is just so compassionate as Jesus. So let's look at Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse 21. You'll remember the story. When Jesus had crossed again back over the Sea of Galilee by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus, remember not all the Pharisees, not all the synagogue rulers, the Pharisees, the uh, leaders of the, in the temple and in, in the synagogues, which is a local church, not all of them hated Jesus. There, there are several mentioned We've mentioned them before that, that really loved and respected Jesus. You remember Joseph of Arimathea gives Jesus a tomb to be buried in. Remember Nicodemus in John chapter 3 came to Jesus one night to ask him. We're going to look at that story pretty soon. And Jairus is one of those. And he came there and he, he fell at Jesus' feet and he pleaded earnestly with Jesus he said, my little daughter, and she's 12 years old, is dying. Please come to my house and put your hands on her that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. That's just a great uh, story, isn't it? So Jesus went with him. He just, this, this father is, is on his knees and he, he himself is a holy man. He's a, he's a uh, a leader. He's a teacher of the word, but he knows that Jesus has a, has a power, has a connection that he doesn't have. And so he goes to Jesus and Jesus said, yeah, I'll go with you. But there's a large crowd following Jesus and they pressed around him. He uses the word press here and in the King James Bible. It's a really great word to describe what's going on. There are people just pressing in around the Lord. And a woman was, was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, uterus trouble. For 12 years, a constant flow. She's anemic, she's sick, she's dehydrated, and she is desperate. She had suffered a great deal at the, under the care of many doctors, and she had spent all the money she had on physicians. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. But she heard about Jesus, and when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched the hem of his cloak, the hem of his garment. It's the, it's the hem of his talit, the, the prayer shawl that Jesus is wearing. And she reaches out and she touches it because she had said to herself, the NIV says she thought to herself, and the, the uh, other version said she said to herself, so she's talking to herself. She's thinking to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his clothes, the hem of his shawl, I will be healed. And so she touched it and immediately her bleeding stopped and she got a jolt of electricity. The King James Virgin called it virtue, but it's power. She felt power come out of his body and into hers. Do you believe that Jesus can heal somebody inadvertently or accidentally? Look, look, look at what happens next. This is verse 30. And once Jesus realized that power had gone out of him, he turned around and asked, who touched my clothes? And his disciples are, they're like teenagers. They are teenagers. And so they, they say, duh, what do you mean who touched you? Look at the press, meaning look at the crowd pressing in everybody has touched you. But Jesus ignored their snarky comeback and he looked around to see who had touched him with faith. Not everybody who touches Jesus touches him with faith. Jesus doesn't, he doesn't grant her request. He doesn't grant her healing. She reached out and got it. Boy, I'm telling you, that is, that is so exciting. That just that just challenges me, friends. This challenges me. And then the woman who, who knew what had happened to her, she came and she fell at Jesus' feet, trembling with fear, and she told him the whole truth. Now, why would she be trembling with fear? Well, she was bleeding, 
And that's considered in the Old Testament law to be unclean. And if you're unclean, you cannot touch another person because if you touch another person, they become unclean. And that's what makes, that's what makes her touching Jesus so controversial. And if you remember just a few Sundays ago, we told the story about Jesus touching a leper. That's what made that story so, so incredible, so amazing. What is she, what's going to happen to her if she purposely goes and she touches people while she herself is unclean? What, what's going to happen to her? Well, friends, she could be put to death. It's a serious thing. She's scared. And then, but she comes clean. She knows she's healed. But Jesus, Jesus knew he healed somebody. He just didn't know who. <laughs> is that not the most exciting story that you can ever imagine? An incidental healing. By the way, this is not the story that we're reading today. This is the story within the story. We, Jesus is still on his way to the, to the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. And so Jesus looks at her, and there's just a wonderful sermon here, and I should just stop and preach it, but I want to get to the other story. Jesus said to her, daughter, that's a sweet thing, isn't it? Isn't it? Daughter? He said, you're mine, I'm yours. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Oh, Jesus is so good. He is so good. He didn't judge her. He didn't ask her to repent. He didn't lead her in the sinner's prayer. He didn't do any of the things that I would just automatically go to. He just healed her. And we know that when Jesus heals somebody, Part of that is spiritual. Jesus said, if there's any sick among you, or James said, if there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. They shall anoint them with oil. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. And if they've committed any sins, they'll be forgiven. And so we got this holistic God who loves us with a holistic love. And he just does, bam, what a miracle. What a miracle. Now, we should just all stop right here. We should have a prayer meeting. We should clap our hands. We should run around the building. We should do the Jericho march. We should, this story is so remarkable. This woman who had been sick for 12 years and suffered at the hands of all her physicians, who hasn't hugged her children, who hasn't hugged her mom, who hasn't been with her husband, who hasn't had any type of life, who's been a social outcast for 12 years because of an enlarged uterine, we're told, that uh, uterus, we're told, this this woman is now healed. Let's just celebrate. Gosh, she's been hanging in there for so long. Let's just celebrate. But what happens now? We don't even have time to celebrate. We don't have time to praise the Lord. Because as soon as this woman gets healed, Jesus stopped. The crowd pressed in. Virtue flows from him. This woman is healed. But because of that delay, tragedy happens on the on the uh, on the journey let's let's pick this back up let's pick the story back up about verse 35 and while Jesus was still speaking to the woman some men came from the house of Jairus the synagogue ruler and said your daughter is dead why bother the teacher anymore tell Jesus going about his business we'll we'll, we'll plan the funeral she had been dead for some time because by the time Jesus got there, the mourners were already there. You know, the, the, the family needed, the families in those days needed to go somewhere and, and mourn privately. But a loved one who had died needed sufficient public mourning. And so there were mourners who were paid. They didn't even know. Jairus probably, or didn't even know his family, maybe not even heard of this little girl. But they get paid. They get paid to come in and mourn. Just like we have these rent -a mobs and rent -a crowds and you can get one up. You know, they're paid. They get paid uh, $15, $20 an hour, and they bust them into these cities to, to, to riot. Well, that, that's, that's what J Jairus was, had at his house when he got there. Jesus makes a remarkable statement. Jesus ignored what these men had said about the little girl being dead. And he looks at Jairus and he says, don't be afraid, 
just believe, or some versions say, don't be afraid, only believe. Uh, there's, there's some comfort in, in, in what Jesus is saying, but not a lot. And it was, I mean, if I'm in the middle of a tragedy and somebody said, don't be afraid, only believe, I don't know how I would interpret that. How, how would I interpret that? What, are they saying, you know, don't worry, be happy? Is Jesus sort of making light of my tragedy? I don't think so. Uh, but Jesus is very direct here. And he's not there to win an argument against the, Jesus ignored the, the men who brought the evil report. The little girl was dead. And he spoke directly to Jairus. He said, keep your faith. And he didn't let anyone else follow him except Peter, James, and John. And when they came to the house of the synagogue ruler, Jairus' house, Jesus saw the commotion and people crying and wailing loudly. These are not family members who are authentically tormented by this sad occasion. These are the, the, the paid mourners. So Jesus comes in and rebukes them. He said, wow, this commotion and, and wailing, this child is not dead. She just appears dead, Jesus said. And they mocked him. They laughed at Jesus. Do you believe that? They laughed at him. You know why? Because they weren't. They weren't truly mourning. They were. This was their job. And they said, "They said, Jesus, you know, we may not know a lot. We may not know a lot, but we know what dead is. And this girl is dead. When I was in seminary, uh, uh, seminary professors used to sort of mock the great doctrines of the church. They would laugh at the." virgin birth or the resurrection of Jesus or the or the raising of the dead that Jesus performed and they said well this is a primitive culture and they didn't really understand biology and they didn't understand listen friends they understood just fine they knew where babies came from when when the when the story of uh, of Mary's uh, conception of Jesus was, was taught and was preached. Everybody in the room that was of age understood where babies come from. And, and you say, well, they're not as smart as we are now. Well, number one, we're not as smart as we think we are. But number two, they knew what dead was. They knew what dead was. These, these people are not as stupid as some suppose. Let's look at this. And he put the mourners out of the room. And then he took the child's mother and father and the disciples who were with him and they went in where the child was. So it's the mom and the dad, Peter, James, and John, Jesus and the little girl. And he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and she walked around. She was 12 years old. And and at this, they were completely astonished. And he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And then they told her, he told them to give the little girl something to eat because ghosts and spirits and zombies don't eat. This girl has been raised from the dead. So this is, this is how this chapter ends. And this, this entire fifth chapter is filled with desperate people. The other story about the demons and the cemetery and the man who was cutting himself and running around just feel they were desperate and the town was desperate and the pigs were desperate. And then Jesus goes to the other side of the lake and he meets a, a, a synagogue ruler who's desperate, a mother and a father who's desperate, a little girl who's desperate. And while Jesus was on his way, to, to, to minister healing to the little girl, a desperate woman touched the hem of his garment. And, uh, and this great story of faith is then mitigated by this sad circumstance where this little girl dies. You know, it kind of reminds me of the story of Lazarus, doesn't it? It's got all those elements in John chapter 11. We preached on this last year, and I won't re-preach it this year, even though we're going to go past it in the Gospels. 
where Jesus is called to his friend Lazarus' house and Jesus goes to Lazarus' house, but he gets there late. He, the Bible says he, is, he, he just sort of uh, dawdles or whatever the word is that he just sort of doesn't get there in time. And, and they're so mad. His Mary and Martha, Lazarus' brothers, are so mad at Jesus. If you'd only come, Jesus, if you'd only come. Goodness, Jesus, why weren't you here? And it's a very similar story because Jesus gets held up on the way for this wonderful healing. And this woman, she just heard about Jesus, this woman with the issue of blood, she just heard about Jesus. But you know, that's really enough. You know what our responsibility is really as, as the church? It's to tell people about Jesus. That's what, we're not responsible for people's salvation. They are saved by grace through faith, right? We're not responsible for those kinds of things. The Holy Spirit does all the heavy lifting. Jesus paid for it all. But we're responsible to share the good news. You, you know what it says? It said that she, this woman with the issue of blood had heard about Jesus. And then Paul explains this to us in Romans chapter 10. He says, faith comes to us when we hear the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, the old version says. Faith cometh by hearing. Faith comes to us when we hear the good news, the living word, the rhema, the rhema word of God. Isn't that amazing? Faith came to this woman. And you know what? As Willie Santiago says uh, in Cuba so often, and John Wimber coined a little phrase back in about 1977 or 76, John Wimber would say, faith is a four-letter word, and it is spelled R-I-S-K. And that, that's what this woman, that's, a, that's what this woman did. She risked. She risked. She said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I can be healed, but nobody can know that I touched him. So she, I've got to sneak up. And you know where she is? She's on the ground. Now, I don't know if she's on the ground because she's weak because she's anemic. I just got this vision of her. You work with me on this. Do you think if you bled consistently for 12 years, you needed a hysterectomy, which wasn't available to her in those days? Do you think if you bled for consistently for 12 years and you were out of money, you think you might have a trouble walking she was down on the ground, wasn't she? She didn't say if I could just touch a lock of his hair. <laughs> she said if I could just get there and touch the hem of his garment. That's where she was. And there are people pressing in and everybody, their brother is pressing in to Jesus. And somehow she managed to get her hand between the legs and around the feet of the people and just touch the, the tallit the little fringes that are hanging down from his, 613 of them, hanging down from his prayer shawl. And, it was a, and when she touched him, he felt it go out of him, but he didn't know who touched him. And, and uh, that story, we need to go over the story with a fine tooth comb. We really need to press into this and see what she did and, and, and look at her victory and admire her faith and her risk but we really don't have time because the story changes so quickly, so quickly to the story of this little girl. I know that uh, those of you watching have children or you have grandchildren, maybe nieces or nephews, maybe a little brother, a little sister. And when they go through bad things, you go through it with them. It, it becomes very painful. And, uh, and the idea of losing your child is just so, it's, it's life's cruelest blow, isn't it? It's life's cruelest blow. I don't think we're meant to, to uh, outlive our children. But you know, friends, we don't die in order. And uh, if we did, we would know who was next. But guess what? We don't know. And so tragic things happen. 
And so Jesus was on his way. He was getting there as fast as he could. But he stopped for this one. And when he stopped for the one, the other one died. And so Jesus made an absurd suggestion. It's just absurd. It's almost offensive in its absurdity. And I think only somebody like Jesus can say this. Jesus said, don't be afraid, only believe. And I like that little, that little, the, the Bible just leaves out tons of details, but it gives us little hints of other deta details that maybe when we're studying the scripture, we just read in the Bible, we just go right past it. The Bible says Jesus ignored the people who brought the evil report. You know, faith comes by hearing. But so does doubt, and so does unbelief. When you hear, when we get negative reports, and that's why I think, friends, it would, it would, it would, we would do well to uh, not to be ignorant, but to on more occasions than not turn off the television and just not tune in to the daily uh, carnage that is the evening news. Some days we just need to walk by faith and, uh, and just believe that our God is, is in control and that even when there's carnage around us that Jesus is on his way and even when our culture looks so dead, we serve a God of resurrection. And uh, Jesus uh, cleared the room Jesus doesn't like a naysayer. Jesus doesn't like people who charge the room with unbelief. You know, there is an atmosphere. We're going to have uh, Leif Haitland here in just a few weeks, and, and he has with him just this cloud of, of faith and hope. He has such a supernatural presence. When he walks into a room, a room could be filled with Muslims. I've seen him stand in stadiums surrounded by uh, Muslims with machine guns. Well, he stood there and preached in soccer stadiums in the Middle East. And he brought just, he just brings such light and such grace and such power, such hope. And it just dispels. Jesus doesn't, he doesn't go for the, uh, uh, Jesus didn't come to win a debate. Jesus did not come to their house to win an argument. He came to their house to raise the dead. How many of you know that a man or a woman, a man or a woman, a person with an experience is never at the mercy of a person with an argument? Jesus walked in that room and all those people were wailing like, you know, and Jesus said, no, 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 no. She's going to be fine. She's, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And they laughed at him. They mocked him, and Jesus said, y'all get out. <laughs> get out. Boy, I tell you what, when Jesus tells you to get out, you go, don't you? Last week, he, he told 6,000 demons to get out, and they got out. Uh, here, Jesus tells these mourners, get out, and they got out. Jesus changed the atmosphere of the room, and from that death came life. Friends, we're, uh, we are the recipients of that same grace, that same power. Let me tell you what uh, uh, Paul said in the eighth chapter of Romans. He said, if that same spirit that rose Christ from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken your mortal body. It will bring you to life. Jesus said, whoever lives and believes in him, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in him shall never die. Friends, we're here in this season of Easter, in this season of resurrection, to proclaim to you that because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Don't be afraid, only believe. Only believe, he said. Don't be afraid, only believe. Let me pray for you right now. Just pray with me, just, just press in right now. Don't be afraid, 
only believe. Even though you die, yet shall you live. And whoever lives and believes in him shall actually never die. John chapter 11. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name for my sisters and brothers who are watching. Lord, some are watching and just enjoying the Sunday morning and it's just a great day. and It's, it's spring in, in Mississippi. It's spring around the world and it's just so, so wonderful on our side of the equator. And Lord, I, I pray for those who are watching right now and and they don't feel so good. And they're wrestling with dark angels. Maybe not demons or maybe not pigs like in last week's story. Maybe not with a chronic illness like the woman with the issue of blood. And maybe not a sickness unto death like, uh, like this young 12 year old girl. But darkness nevertheless, depression, fear, anxiety, Lord, I pray for that person right now in Jesus' name and I ask you to bless them. And Lord, we cannot wait. Lord, those who are praying with me right now, Lord, we are believers and we cannot wait to see you face to face. We hunger and thirst, Lord, to see you face to face. And Lord, if, if we could uh, ask any prayer, Lord, it would be Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come. But Lord, we know that you are delaying your coming because you know that many of us are not ready for you to come. And so Lord, we wait patiently for the full harvest to come in. Nevertheless, Lord, we pray that while we're, while we're here in our living and in our dying, God, you would be strong in us, Lord, and you would help us not to fear, but only believe. Lord, it seems on its face absurd but lord you were telling us to to trust you lord to trust you and so lord we do we do lord we put our trust our faith in you lord we love you lord you are you are everything lord hear our prayer deliver us from evil we pray in the very strong in the very powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. Friends, did you find it odd that Jesus healed somebody accidentally or inadvertently or uh, just, just in, in the course of his day not even knowing who he healed? He didn't know who he healed. <laughs> that is just the best. That's the best, isn't it? But, but he did know why she was healed. He knew why. He didn't know who, but he knew why. Because, because she, she risked because of her faith. Daughter, child of God, your faith has made you whole and freed you. Friends, Jesus is asking us to trust him. It's hard to do sometimes. It's hard to do all the time. It's no easy believism. This is no uh, simple sermon on faith. It, it's when he calls us to believe, he's really calling us to do something, to do something spectacular. It takes risk. Faith is R-I-S-K. We'll never walk on the water if we're afraid to get out of the boat. Have faith in God. I love you. You're the best. I love you so much. I miss you all. I wish every one of you were sitting here in my office. You just about fit. I got the biggest office in the uh, in Mississippi Methodism. Thanks to the good people who worship here. And one day we'll just do a video of my office. And, and when I get I get a few more decorations. <laughs> but uh, but I'm so glad that you're with us today. I will see you next week. God bless you. Bye-bye.